Hey y'all, so here are all 44 presidents rated in 60 seconds each. This has every president besides Joe Biden. You may be thinking, hey, that should be 45 presidents because Joe Biden is the 46th president of the United States. The reason it's 44 is because Grover Cleveland is counted twice as president. Biden is the 46th presidential administration, but it's the 45th person to be president. The videos are ordered in the way that they were originally uploaded. It begins with Trump and ends with Washington. As the countdown, or I guess count up, continues, you're going to see perhaps different standards applied along the way. That's not me being a hypocrite or favoring a president, but rather me learning a better way to grade. You're also going to see the videos improve in quality. This series was not planned. I made the initial Trump video and then people wanted more. If it was planned beforehand, this may look a little different. I should also add that all these presents are graded uh, from a modern day standpoint because, you know, I think that's interesting. Everyone else grades them from a historical perspective and we all know how the list looks. So I think from a modern day perspective, uh, it was a little bit more interesting. So that is, keep that in mind when looking at these ratings. You're also going to see my Twitter animation in every single video. That's how it was posted on the Clock app. It serves two purposes, prevents re-uploads of my content going without credit, and self-promotion. I did not add it in for the sake of YouTube. Anyways, I'm talking for too long. I was thinking about creating a director's cut of this, where I talk about each president between each video, and I'll include Biden's 100-day review in there. Kind of like a one-time podcast. I learned so much about each president, and there really is a story behind my thinking for each video. So if that interests you, let me know down below. Thanks for watching, give it a like if you liked it, and don't forget to subscribe. Enjoy. As we do at the end of every presidential term, we'll be grading Donald Trump's presidency, and then we're never talking about him ever again. We're grading based on these three categories. Starting with the economy, it did really well under Trump in his first three years. Manufacturing jobs and wages increased, investments also increased. The economy was truly booming. However, in 2020, destroyed any credit he gets for the economy, pretending the virus didn't exist, and then actively attacking mitigation efforts, put the economy into a massive crater. He gets a C. For domestic matters, he was completely out of touch with the country. When you're the president, part of your job is to at least pretend to care about what the public is saying. He poured fuel on the fire every chance he got, responding with force to protests, only makes the protest bigger and fiercer. The grade is a F. In foreign relations, he was correct in his diagnosis of the China threat. However, he failed in every other regard. He got played by North Korea, relations with Iran got even worse, and Russia ran wild. Our allies in the EU and NATO moved away from us, he abandoned the Kurds and left them for dead, then he had these bogus peace deals between a bunch of countries that didn't even have beef. He gets a F here. Overall, Trump gets an F+. He consistently got in his own way. A quieter, more compassionate Trump who successfully handed 2020 as a two-term president. The last one was so loved, so now we're grading Obama's presidency. We're grading based on these three categories. Starting with the economy, Obama inherited what was at the time the worst economic crisis since the Great Depression. When he first came into office, unemployment rate was 10%, and when he left, it was 4.8%. In his presidency, he saw 75 consecutive months of job growth, and he saved the auto industry. There are plenty of studies showing that the economy Trump had is because of Obama's economic recovery. He gets an A for the economy. When it comes to domestic affairs, President Obama saved and improved a lot of lives with the ACA and DACA. However, domestic spying increased, and his failure to act on police militarization earlier is going to result in him getting a B. Foreign relations was a tough one for Obama. He blocked a nuclear Iran, normalized relations with Cuba, and got a global commitment to climate change. A big part of his foreign policy was the belief that not every global problem has an American solution. This restraint was loved by allies, but also led to him getting blamed for a lot of the world's ills. The grade is a C. Overall, Obama gets a B plus. He's often judged by what he could have done, and when we do that, we forget everything he was able to do. We're rating all the presidents of the modern era in these three categories. Today is George W. Bush. When it comes to the economy, Bush had a temporarily booming economy thanks to tax cuts. However, these tax cuts would increase the deficit and actually result in slower economic growth. They were also a key contributing factor to the economy falling into the worst economic crisis since the Great Depression. He will score a D. Bush's domestic relations always struggled. His educational reforms were abandoned by his own party midway through his own term. New Orleans is still recovering from his disastrous Hurricane Katrina response. However, the Medicaid Part D expansion they oversaw dramatically changed a lot of lives. That'll get him a D. Foreign relations was a disaster. The invasion of Afghanistan initially had just cause. The Taliban was protecting Al-Qaeda and refused to hand bin Laden over to NATO. People forget this, but Afghanistan is the only time that Article 5 of NATO was ever been used. The war was poorly handled, and there was, and still is, a serious lack of a plan. The Iraq war is going to go down as one of the worst foreign policy decisions, if not the worst, of the modern era. So many dead, a region destabilized, all for essentially nothing. His PEPFAR initiative is estimated to have saved over 17 million lives. The impact of it truly can't be minimized. However, he's still getting an F in foreign relations. Overall, Bush gets a D. The only reason this isn't an F is because of the impact PEPFAR had, and the impact it continues to have. We're rating presidents again with the same criteria as always. Today is the 42nd president, Bill Clinton. We talk a lot about booming economies, but Bill Clinton's economy was screaming. He created 18.7 million jobs. That's a record. He also repealed Reagan-era trickle-down tax cuts and raised taxes on the rich. The increased taxes mixed with the screaming economy gave the U.S. government a budgetary surplus, which he used to pay off the national debt. His economy gets an A. Violent crime began to fall dramatically during Clinton's presidency. Clinton's investments in education and sciences helped the United States dominate the internet industry. His domestic reforms did not age well at all. His welfare reform caused child poverty to fall to its lowest level ever, but it only saw positive results
results because of the superb economy. When the economy slowed down in the 2000s, the reform became an absolute disaster. The crime bill of 1994 didn't cause mass incarceration. The US already had the world's largest prison population by 1990. It did exasperate and accelerate the incarceration trends that were on the rise for decades though. It absolutely destroyed minority communities. He'll get a D. Clinton was a president in a post-Cold War, pre-9-11 world. Nothing really happened. This will get him a B. Overall to C. George H.W. Bush, perhaps the most qualified person to have become president and the father of George W. Bush. This is the criteria. Let's see how he did. Bush really got the short end of the stick when it came to Reaganomics, or as he called it, voodoo economics. The growing government deficits helped cause a recession, and Bush had to raise taxes in order to avoid massive spending cuts. This was massively unpopular and cost him re-election, but it was the right decision to make. He'll get a C. Bush lacked a grand vision domestically. He championed the American Disabilities Act. The ADA gave a second lease on life to so many people with disabilities. He also increased environmental regulations. However, there's a lot to be said about his handling of AIDS. Some say that he didn't do enough. That's a B. Bush really excelled in foreign policy. Saddam attempted to annex Kuwait during Bush's presidency. Bush put together a 33-country coalition and got the endorsement of the Soviet Union to drive Iraq out of Kuwait. This was the first war the U.S. had won since Vietnam, and is still considered one of the most impressive military victories of the past 100 years. He successfully managed a collapsing Soviet Union. He refused to take the victory lap or declare victory. He'll get an A. Overall, Bush gets a B. Bush is a great example that when you do things right, people won't be sure you've done anything. Ronald Reagan, an icon to some, a devil to others. Here's our criteria. Let's see how he did. Reagan's fiscal policy was nicknamed Reaganomics or Voodoo Economics. The savings from paying taxes was supposed to trickle down. Instead, income inequality only increased and the poverty rate had risen. Reagan ended the severe recession the U.S. was in, but the solution was a one-hit wonder that didn't really achieve its actual goal. He gets a C. Reagan's domestic policy record is controversial. As president, he cut education funding by 50%. This resulted in the poorest test scores and literacy rates dropping. His war on drugs resulted in rapid increase in incarceration for minorities. His dismissal of the AIDS epidemic will forever live in infamy. Over 16,000 people died before he even mentioned the word AIDS and called on Congress to take action. It's an F. Reagan gets credit for ending the Cold War and I'd say that's fair. It was ending anyways, but the new arms race increased the speed of the USSR's collapse. During the Iran-Iraq War, the US was funding Iraq's military efforts, but Reagan and the CIA illegally sold weapons to Iran so they could take the profit and give it to the Contras in South America. Most have categorized this as treason. Anyways, he'll get a D in foreign relations. Overall, Reagan gets a D. Reagan, like Clinton, just does not age well. Jimmy Carter, a great humanitarian and the first one-term president since Hoover. Here's the criteria. Carter inherited a slow economy of rising inflation. He sped up the recovery by creating millions of public jobs through the Public Works Act. But a year later, the U.S. had fallen into an energy crisis because of several wars in the Middle East. So the U.S. fell right back into a recession. Carter did appoint the head of the Federal Reserve who ended the U.S. inflation crisis, though. Carter will get a C. Domestically, Carter was ahead of his time. He promoted energy efficiency and renewable energy during the energy crisis. Carter also deregulated the airline industry and the American beer industry. Industry. He created the Department of Education, Energy, and Health and Human Services. This will get him a B. Carter brokered the Camp David Accords. He managed to get Israel and Egypt to agree to a peace deal. He later won a Nobel Prize for this. In 1979, Iran took 52 Americans hostage for 444 days. Carter was unable to free the hostages due to failed diplomacy and botched rescue missions. In reflection, Carter has acknowledged that he could have wiped Iran off the map and won re-election because of it. But as he said, peace is hard, war is popular. This is a B. Overall, Carter gets a C, a profoundly good man who was a mediocre Gerald Ford, the only person to be both president and vice president without having been elected to either position. His presidency is the shortest in U.S. history for any president who didn't die in office. When it comes to the economy, Ford battled inflation unsuccessfully, and the economy fell into an awful recession. That's a D. Ford's legacy domestically is essentially the pardoning of Nixon. It set the precedent that the president is above the law. It also shattered any remaining trust and credibility the government had with the American public after Vietnam. I'll show you one of the impacts of this pardon. This is all the presidents since 1945. The top row is presidents with several years of experience in D.C. Notice how they all serve from 1945 until 1976, with the exception of Bush Sr. and Joe Biden. The bottom row is presidents who were considered outsiders due to lack of D.C. experience. Every president on here is post-1976. Obama was a senator for two years, but that essentially means nothing. Of the eight presidents since Ford's pardon, six of them have been outsiders. One of the consequences of Ford's pardon is the complete distrust in politicians. 46 years later, experience in D.C. is still looked at with suspicion by the public. Ford gets a F domestically. In foreign relations, he wrapped up the U.S. involvement in Vietnam, and he funded a genocide in East Timor. That's an F. Overall, F. Richard Nixon, the only president to resign from the office. Here's the criteria, let's see how he did. Nixon removed the US from the gold standard by making the dollar a fiat currency. However, his mishandling of several economic crises created the stagflation of the 70s that would haunt the next two presidents. He gets a D. Domestically, Nixon was, well, you decide. He expanded affirmative action and social security, he created the EPA and OSHA, he passed several environmental regulations, and he supported the Equal Rights Amendment. However, he also supported the drug war. There's just one major problem as well. Nixon was a crook. He attempted to cover up Watergate with a kidnapping, destroying 
destroying evidence and turning the CIA against the FBI. He also had people break into the doctor's office of the Pentagon Papers leaker so that he could discredit him. It has to be a F. Nixon went to China and opened trade with China. He also ended the Vietnam War. But once again, Nixon was a crook. In 1968, he sabotaged LBJ's peace talks of Vietnam. This decision led to an additional 21,000 US soldiers and hundreds of thousands of civilians dying before he'd end the war using the same terms that he sabotaged five years earlier. Obviously, it's an F. Overall, Nixon gets an F. If you attack democracy and the rule of law, you'll always get an F. Lyndon Johnson, one of the most tragic presidents. As always, here's the criteria. LBJ had a great economy, unemployment was low, and the GDP grew. From FDR until Nixon, the economy only grew. So he'll get an A. Johnson was an extremely experienced legislator, and he successfully used the political capital that came from Kennedy's death to push massive civil rights legislation through Congress. He could have chosen to push anything, but he chose civil rights. The Civil Rights Act and the Voting Rights Act are still the biggest pieces of civil rights legislation passed in this country. He had this vision of a great society. He waged a war on poverty. A lot of the social programs that we have today came from LBJ. This will earn him an A. Is the situation that led to the Vietnam War LBJ's fault? No, Eisenhower and JFK kept escalating the situation in Vietnam. However, LBJ made the decision to go to war. Whether he really had a choice or not will be debated forever, but that decision ultimately makes the war his fault to an extent. Vietnam took the US off the path that so many European countries continue down. He gets an F. Overall, LBJ gets a C. He's a great example of how complicated a presidential legacy can be. John F. Kennedy, a cult of personality. Here's a criteria, let's see how he did. When it comes to the economy, everything was in fine shape, manufacturing increased, inflation stayed down. It was a post-World War II economy, nothing really unique here. He'll get an A for the economy. Domestically, Kennedy supported civil rights federally in his actions and in his words. He launched a campaign against racial discrimination. However, there has been a lot of rightful criticism that he didn't push as hard as he could have. He'd often hamper the movement by publicly suggesting that they instigated violence, and he authorized the wiretap of Martin Luther King Jr. Kennedy championed the space race as well, but he would ultimately never see the result of this. Get a B. Kennedy did escalate the Vietnam War. He also launched the failed Bay of Pigs invasion. The story of the Cuban Missile Crisis often gets told backwards. The US placed missiles in Turkey. This gave the USSR the motivation to place missiles in Cuba. Their goal being to get the missiles in Turkey removed or to keep the missiles in Cuba. To de-escalate, Kennedy agreed to remove the missiles in Turkey in exchange to Soviets remove the missiles from Cuba. A win for world peace, but ultimately a loss for America and a win for the Soviets. He'll get a C. Overall, Kennedy gets a B. Kennedy's death accomplished more than his life, something most can only dream of. Dwight Eisenhower, the president, not the general. As always, here's our criteria. Let's see how he did. I inherited a post-World War II economy. The rest of the world was still rebuilding while the U.S. was basically untouched. Eisenhower did help the economy grow even more by passing the interstate highway system. That's an A. Domestically, it's complicated. The interstate highway system revolutionized the country. It's why grocery stores seem to never run out of food. However, there is a dark side. When the interstates were being constructed, they were intentionally made to go straight through black neighborhoods. Entire communities were forced to leave. He did accelerate the process of desegregation. However, he also banned LGBT people from serving in the government. This would get him a C. In hindsight, Eisenhower had a disastrous foreign policy. I'm sure at the time it seemed logical, but looking back on it, oof. He used the CIA to overthrow Iran's government, a move that is still one of the central points of contention in the Iranian-American relations. He also began the US involvement in Vietnam due to his belief in the domino theory. He also threatened to nuke China, but that helped end the Korean War. I get to F. Overall, I get to C. Harry S. Truman. Technically, the period shouldn't be after the S because the S doesn't stand for anything. His middle name is just a letter S. But anyways, here's a criteria. Let's see how he did. Truman quite literally had a post-World War II economy. Things were pretty good. That's an A. Truman proposed anti-discrimination hiring practices as well as expanding voting rights. None of these measures would pass Congress. He also desegregated the military. He saw the hypocrisy in the U.S. setting up the New World Order based on human rights and democracy, while those same values didn't exist at home. He tried to undermine several worker strikes by nationalizing steel. Ultimately, the Supreme Court rebuked him on that. This will get him a B. Truman implemented the Marshall Plan, which was very effective in helping Europe's economy rebound. Truman really set up the modern world order that we have today. The Berlin airlift was a very clever way of not risking war with the Soviets. He also adopted the policy of containment. Its failures are widely known, its success not so much. However, it did work in spite of the clear moral failings of the policy. The dropping of the bombs is a very intense topic. Right or wrong, the use of nuclear weapons gave the world a picture of the devastation that awaits if they're used again. Truman will get a C. Overall, Truman gets a B. Franklin Delano Roosevelt, America's first physically disabled president, here's the criteria, let's see how he did. FDR became president during the Great Depression. His New Deal reforms and policies pulled the United States out of the Great Depression in just six years. He'll get an A for the economy. FDR issued an executive order that banned discrimination in the federal workforce. This resulted in over a million new jobs for black men and white women. This creates a new framework for the federal government to become the protector of everyone, a role that would be expanded in the next two decades and take its ultimate form with LBJ signing of the Civil Rights Act. The internment of Japanese Americans is a stain on his legacy. He put Japanese 
Americans in these camps when the US entered the war. While they weren't death camps, it ruined lives and that's truly where the devastation lies. FDR was far from perfect domestically, but he ultimately created the framework for further equality that his successors would use to fulfill the promise the Constitution had made 170 years earlier. That's an A. FDR guided the Allies to victory in World War II. That's not to say he's solely responsible, he needed Churchill and Stalin as much as they needed him. So that's an A. FDR transformed the United States into the largest cultural, economic, and military superpower in history. He's our first A. Herbert Hoover, the president who was so loved they named towns after him. Here's a criteria, let's see how he did. Seven months after Hoover became president, the stock market crashed. Remember, we don't judge presidents on things that happened to them, but how they handled it. Hoover opposed direct government intervention. As we know today, government spending is the best way to end a recession or a depression. Hoover refused federal intervention for two years and the depression worsened. The unemployment rate reached 25%. It wasn't until 1932 that he began federal intervention into the depression. That's an F for the economy. Hoover supported prohibition. When the Great Depression hits, white people start blaming Mexican immigrants and citizens for the depression. So his Secretary of Labor created this policy that is now called Mexican Repatriation, where an estimated 400,000 to 2 million Mexican immigrants, majority of which who were actually American citizens, ended up being deported. Historians have said that this matches the modern day definition for ethnic cleansing. That's an F. When it comes to foreign relations, Hoover didn't really do anything. He's the last president who didn't have to worry about the rest of the world. Well, throw him a C, I guess. He really didn't do anything, but this is why tomorrow we're debuting a new criteria. Overall, Hoover gets an F. Calvin Coolidge. While most presidents are remembered for what they said, he's remembered for what he didn't say. Here's our new criteria. The economy is being merged with domestic, creating domestic matters. Foreign relations is staying in the new category is racial equity. Domestically, Coolidge oversaw the Roaring Twenties. The economy saw rapid growth under Coolidge. The Twenties were roaring for the rich, but not the poor. 60% of Americans lived in poverty, and farmers really struggled during this time as well. Coolidge believed in laissez-faire capitalism. The hands-off approach made the economy boom, but only for a select few. The 1920s wasn't a great time to be alive if you weren't rich. He'll get a D. Abroad, Coolidge tried to make amends with Latin America after the recent history of US interventions in Latin American affairs. Coolidge worked with other countries to ban war. Obviously, it didn't work, but it was a noble effort. He also pushed the U.S. to join the world court, but the Senate blocked his efforts. That's a B. Coolidge granted citizenship to all Native Americans. He despised the Klan, and he spoke in favor of civil rights. When it comes to civil rights, Coolidge lacked action, mostly because any measure he tried to pass was blocked by the Congress. That's an A. Overall, Coolidge gets a C. Warren Harding. Before the Nixon and Trump circuses, there was Warren Harding, who died two years into his presidency. Here's our criteria, let's see how he did. Harding said himself that he didn't know how to be president, so he surrounded himself with his friends and people who gave him money. This is going to be a big shocker, but those people also didn't know how to do their job, and a lot of them ended up being corrupt. His attorney general was nearly impeached, and he was indicted twice for defrauding the United States. The most notable example of his administration's corruption was the Teapot Dome scandal. It was considered to be the worst political scandal in American history before Watergate and Trump Ukraine. In terms of other domestic things, he supported an eight-hour work week. That's an F. Harding refused to allow the U.S. to join the League of Nations. He also tried to repair relations with Latin America after the previous presidents made it a mess. That's a C. Harding, like Coolidge, was a vocal supporter of civil rights. His reasoning was essentially that if we all have equal education and economic opportunities, then the economy will do better. Du Bois argued at the time that this was the most support a president had ever given the civil rights, but that perhaps his support was for the wrong reasons. That's a B. Overall, Harding gets a D. Woodrow Wilson, one of our most racist and most important presidents. Here's a criteria, let's see how he did. Wilson established a Federal Reserve. He also passed several antitrust laws. He banned child labor and fought for eight-hour workdays. Wilson reestablished a federal income tax. He also supported women's suffrage. However, Wilson also passed a law that made it illegal to criticize the United States. He censored the mail and spied on citizens. He had recent immigrants to the United States deported if they criticized the U.S.'s war efforts in World War I. When widespread race massacres consumed entire U.S. cities in the summer of 1919, he didn't take action to quell them. Domestically, Wilson gets a D. Wilson kept the United States out of World War I for three years. He tried to mediate the war several times, but he ultimately got the U.S. involved in the war due to the Zimmerman telegram and Germany sinking U.S. ships. He goes to the negotiations after the war with a big self-determination agenda, and he fails to promote it at all. He's the grandfather of American interventions. The U.S. got involved in the Russian Civil War, occupied Haiti, and ordered intervention with a lot of Central America. He did try to set the League of Nations, though. That's a noble effort. He'll get a D. Wilson was a massive racist, even for his time. He segregated the federal government, destroyed black employment, in the and he expressed sympathies for the Klan. That's an F. Overall, Wilson gets an F. Will William Howard Taft. I'm sorry to tell you this, but he did not get stuck in a bathtub. Taft was relentlessly mocked for his weight while being president, and sometimes the cruel, humiliating rumors of the past become facts of the present. Here's a criteria, let's see how it did. Taft's crowning domestic achievement is that he was the great trust buster. He broke up 99 trusts in only four years. If Amazon existed in 1909, you can bet that Taft would have broken it up. Taft reduced tariffs and created a corporate income tax. He also made post offices into banks. Hmm, sounds familiar. Taft also signed the Publicity Act, which forced political parties to disclose who their donors are and who they donated to. Taft gets an A domestic 
domestically. Abroad, Taft had a policy called dollar diplomacy. The United States would give big loans to, or make investments in, Latin American and East Asian countries, in an attempt to use U.S. trade to get them to do what the U.S. wanted, and to put a stop to European interests. Big shocker, this never went as planned, and it resulted in the U.S. intervening a lot because the U.S. wanted to protect his investment. That'll be an F. Taft was said to be a warm-hearted, kind man, but as our grandparents have taught us, that doesn't mean he can't be an awful racist. Taft fired the majority of black government appointees. He wrote that he didn't believe black people were developed enough to be ready to vote. It's an F. Overall, Taft gets a D. Theodore Roosevelt. He is the only president to have successfully hunted a mountain lion with only a knife. Teddy was larger than life. He is perhaps the most interesting person to be president, and he is the youngest person to ever be president. Here's the criteria. Let's see how he did. Teddy was a trust buster. He broke up 44 trusts in seven years. He pushed regulations for various industries. Teddy's Square Deal program attacked corporations, fought for workers, and protected national resources. Teddy improved labor conditions, and he created the FDA. He was a massive conservationist, and he created over 150 national forests. That'll land him an A. Teddy's foreign policy was called Big Stick Diplomacy. He made the U.S. Navy into a global power. The U.S. Navy would turn up in a country's port, and the country would be forced to accept diplomatic solutions that weren't exactly fair because they couldn't refuse. You know, because of the implication. Roosevelt guaranteed Latin American debts to Europe through American military force. He did successfully negotiate the end to the Russo-Japanese War, though, and won a Nobel Peace Prize for it. He also oversaw the construction of the Panama Canal. He'll get a B-. Teddy was a white supremacist, but he also believed in equal opportunity and treatment regardless of race. His views are complicated. That's a D. Overall, Teddy gets a C. William McKinley, the last president to have fought in the Civil War. He was assassinated in office by a socialist anarchist who believed him to be the cause of inequality. Here's the criteria, let's see how he did. McKinley broke up some trust, not to the extent that his two successors would though. He generally held the belief that perhaps consolidation wasn't that bad. He instituted the gold standard, he raised tariffs to lower internal taxes, but his view on tariffs would change. A day before his assassination, he announced that he was lowering tariffs. Domestically, he'll get a C. McKinley was a wartime president. He oversaw the Spanish-American War, which is the United States officially ending the declining Spanish Empire. The war was incredibly lopsided. In just three months, the United States defeated Spain in the Caribbean, the Philippines, and the Pacific. This resulted in the U.S. acquiring the Philippines, Guam, and Puerto Rico from Spain. It would also acquire Cuba, which it would give independence to in 1902. This established the U.S. as an international force. He would also officially annex Hawaii. He'll get a B. In the late 1890s, Jim Crow laws were spreading rapidly in the South, and white-on-black terrorism reached one of its highest levels. Black voters had largely supported McKinley, but despite that, he didn't do anything to stop the South backsliding like previous presidents had. That'll earn him an F. Overall, he gets a D. Grover. No, let me finish. Grover Cleveland. Thank you. Cleveland is the only president to have served two non-consecutive terms, something that could never happen again, right? He also married a woman who he used to babysit, so as a result, Frances Cleveland is our youngest first lady ever at age 21. Here's her criteria. Let's see how he did. Cleveland believed in free trade and he tried to reduce tariffs. He failed in his first term to pre tariffs, but in his second term he succeeded. He opposed bimetallism and he also issued the most vetoes of any president up until then. Cleveland was not a friend of the working class, to put it nicely. He'll get a C domestically. Cleveland didn't believe in U.S. intervention. He opposed the annexation of Hawaii and he expanded the Monroe Doctrine by declaring that anything that happens in the Americas is the United States business. He'll get a C. Cleveland fought against the federal elections bill. The bill was going to allow the federal government to regulate states' elections. More specifically, it was to protect black voters' right to vote in the South. The failure of this bill only emboldened the American South and resulted in more and more voting restrictions until 1965 for the Voting Rights Act. He refused to use the federal government to enforce the 15th Amendment. That'll land him a big fat F. Overall, he gets a D. Benjamin Harrison. This guy is one of the most underrated presidents you've never heard about. Here's a criteria. Let's see how he did. Harrison admitted six new states into the Union. He also passed the Sherman Antitrust Act, which is what Teddy and Taft would use to become known as trust busters. He also started the National Forest by making Yellowstone the first national forest. Harrison pushed for higher tariffs, and this is often said to be one of the reasons for the economic collapse of 1893. That will get him a C domestically. Harrison was really the first president since Lincoln to seek an active foreign policy agenda. He demonstrated that the United States was willing to stand up for American interests. Whether that be a dispute of Great Britain over whether or not seals in Alaska are considered domesticated animals and therefore property of the United States, or nearly going to war with Chile and Italy. He had a lot of missteps internationally, but for what it's worth, Teddy Roosevelt took inspiration in his foreign policy. He'll get a D. Harrison fought to secure black civil rights through the federal elections bill, but the bill and several like it would be blocked in the Senate. Southern states began stripping their black citizens of their rights, completely erasing 20 years of progress. Harrison was very firm in his stance that states can't be trusted to uphold civil rights, a stance that is still true to this day. He'll get an A. Overall, he gets a See. Chester A. Arthur, who was either our first Canadian-born president or our first president from Vermont. Here's a criteria, let's see how he did. Arthur was the face of political machine corruption when he ascended to the presidency, so much so that the person who killed President Garfield did so under the belief that Arthur would give him a job for making him president. When Arthur took the office, he pulled a complete 180. He reformed the entire federal civil service program. It used to be that if you wanted a job in the federal government, you needed to donate to and support someone running for president. Arthur changed that dramatically and made aspects of that illegal. For that, he'll get a B. Abroad, Arthur didn't really do anything. 
everything. He tried to expand U.S. trade with Latin America, and he revitalized the U.S. Navy. That'll give him a C. Arthur signed the Chinese Exclusion Act, which banned Chinese immigration. It is the only law in the history of the country to ban a group of people based on their ethnic group. This law led to a driving out period in which massacres of Chinese citizens and immigrants happened throughout the western United States. Arthur increased education funding for Native Americans. Before he became president, Arthur was a civil rights lawyer. So when the Supreme Court struck down the Civil Rights Act of 1875, while he was president, he attempted to lobby Congress to pass a new bill in his place, but he ultimately failed. He'll get an F. Overall, D. James Garfield. Here's a fun fact. The cat Garfield is named after Jim Davis's grandfather, who was named after President Garfield. Garfield, the man, not the cat, was president for six months before he would die from an assassination. Here's a criteria. Let's see how he did. Garfield appointed an abolitionist to the Supreme Court. He tried to implement civil service reform. He also purged all corruption from the United States Post Office. He also wanted to implement a universal education system. That'll get him an A. Garfield believed in free trade as a way to reduce British influence in South America and as a way to bring more prosperity to the country. That's a B. Garfield was a massive supporter of civil rights. He appointed four black men to his administration. He believed that by expanding public education in the South, black Southerners would be able to beat Southern attempts to strip their rights away. That's an A. That puts Garfield at a B overall. JFK is always viewed as the great what-if president, but the true great what-if president is Garfield. In a universe where he survives, there's reason to believe that the civil rights struggle that followed his death and continues to plague the nation today doesn't happen, or goes a bit differently. The America we know today would look a lot different. Rutherford B. Hayes. He was an abolitionist who defended refugee slaves in court and was a Civil War hero for the Union before becoming president. With that said, Hayes' legacy will forever be linked to how he was elected. Anyways, here's a criteria. Let's see how he did. Hayes ended Reconstruction. Part of the deal that got him elected was that he would end Reconstruction. However, Democrats held the House and were going to block funding for it either way. Hayes attempted civil service reform. He also returned the United States to the gold standard. Hayes began the Indian boarding schools, which saw the United States government essentially kidnapping thousands of Native American children and forcing them into assimilation schools. That'll land him an F. Hayes negotiated a territory dispute in the Paraguayan War. He awarded Paraguay the disputed land, and as a result, the country named one of their states after him. He also advanced discussion of the Panama Canal. He also vetoed anti-Chinese immigration laws. That'll get him a C. The South tried to repeal laws that cracked down on the Klan and prohibited them from infringing on voting rights. Hayes vetoed these laws three times. Eventually, the Southern-controlled Congress decided to cut funding for federal marshals, essentially undermining federal attempts to enforce black voting rights. That'll get Hayes an A. Overall, he gets a C. Ulysses S. Grant, the man who saved the United States, here's a criteria, let's see how our great American hero did as president. Grant handled Reconstruction his entire presidency. Grant pushed for the 15th Amendment to be ratified, and he signed the Naturalization Act, which made all people of African descent citizens. He passed several voter protection laws in the Civil Rights Act of 1875. He used military force to enforce black civil rights and ensure that black elected officials in the South could assume office. He assigned the Force Acts, which allowed him to suspend due process for Klan members and use military force on the Klan, which resulted in him destroying the Klan. However, Grant signed the Amnesty Act, which allowed Confederate soldiers to seek office again, and there was a lot of corruption in his administration. That all dropped him to an A-. Abroad, Grant really didn't do anything. He sought treaties and to protect trade routes, so he'll get a C. Grant was a civil rights hero. He pushed for and protected civil rights. He wasn't afraid to use the military to put down continued insurrections from Southerners who refused to accept the results of the war and black civil rights. His ultimate failure was his inability to make Northerners understand why Reconstruction was necessary. That'll get him an A. Overall, Grant gets a B. Andrew Johnson. Johnson was from way down south in the land of traitors. Here's a criteria. Let's see why he is one of the worst presidents we've ever had. Despite the four-year war that the South started to defend slavery and resulted in 750,000 soldiers' deaths, Johnson thought that the Southern states should be given their statehood back without concessions. He reinstated Southern state governments who would then draft up the first versions of Jim Crow. After the Union had conquered the South, General Sherman, with the approval of Lincoln, gave plantation owners land to their freed slaves. Johnson revoked that order, removing the newly freed slaves from the land, and gave it back to the treasonous Confederate soldiers who started sharecropping, which was neo-slavery. He vetoed a Civil Rights Act and opposed the 14th Amendment. He was hell-bent on allowing Southern states to stop black people from voting. Newly freed slaves were being slaughtered in the South, and Johnson refused to intervene, essentially condoning the terrorism. Reconstruction failed because Johnson made it fail. He gets a double F. Abroad, he purchased Alaska, that's a C. His commitment to prevent black equality is at its core one of the reasons why America seems to still be fighting a war that ended 155 years earlier, why it still has not lived up to its founding words written 245 years earlier. He gets an F. Overall, he gets an F. Abraham Lincoln. Lincoln, the man who preserved the Union. Here's a criteria, let's see how he did. Lincoln's entire presidency is the Civil War. He trusted the wrong generals initially, but he ultimately ended up trusting General Grant and Sherman to bring the South to its knees. The South started the war to protect slavery, but the North fought the war to preserve the Union. As newly freed slaves started joining the Union Army, the North's reasoning for fighting the war, the North's opinion on abolition, and Lincoln's attitude changed. The war started to become about freedom, and that's reflected in the Union Army's songs. Lincoln won the war, that's an A. 
One of the reasons Lincoln signed the Emancipation Proclamation was to keep France and Britain from intervening on the side of the Confederacy. It worked, he gets an A there too. Lincoln started his presidency disapproving of slavery and not viewing black Americans as an important part of American society. By the end of the war, he had abolished slavery in the South with the Emancipation Proclamation, and he had gotten the 13th Amendment through Congress. Lincoln's views on race are complicated, but three days before he was killed, he gave a speech suggesting that black men be allowed to vote. His assassin, John Wilkes Booth, was in the crowd and said that will be this man's last speech. He gets an A. Overall, he gets an A. Let me tell you about our second worst president, and be sure to watch to the end so you can fully understand this train wreck. His name is James Buchanan, and he was incompetent, ineffective, and arrogant. He thought that people would view him the same way as they view Washington. He didn't cause a civil war, but he tried really hard to not stop it. As always, we grade them on this criteria, let's see why he was so awful. After a series of events and wild rumors, Buchanan believed Mormons to be an open rebellion of the United States. He sent the U.S. Army to Utah. Chaos broke out in an event that is now called the Utah War. During the bleeding Kansas confrontations, he chose a pro-slavery government for Kansas despite Kansas voters favoring anti-slavery. He tried to both sides the incoming civil war, not because he was a peacemaker, but because he favored the South. He gave weapons and supplies to the South that they would then use to fire upon U.S. ships, which Buchanan willfully ignored. He'll land a hot F. His foreign policy can be summed up by courting different Latin American countries in hopes that they would let him send Mormons there. This included potentially buying Alaska and making it a Mormon colony. That's an F. Buchanan convinced the Supreme Court to make such a broad ruling in Dred Scott. So obviously that'll land him an F. Overall, he gets an F. He's the first president to land straight Fs. I'm going to tell you about our third worst president. That's right, back to back. Be sure to watch the end so you can fully understand this disaster. Franklin Pierce, probably best known for being good looking and living a really tragic life. All three of his kids died in the span of seven years. Here's a criteria. Let's see why being hot doesn't make you a good president. Pierce was a strong believer in the Kansas-Nebraska Act. The act repealed the Missouri Compromise. Before this, you couldn't own slaves above a certain point. The Kansas-Nebraska Act made it so that populations in the state could determine whether or not they had slaves. This created pandemonium. It started the bleeding Kansas situation where pro-slavery and anti slavery slavery settlers just began attacking each other. Here's a metaphor for it. You know how the USSR and the US would give arms and money to opposing factions to fight each other? The Kansas-Nebraska Act kind of created that between the North and the South. You can't spell Franklin without an F. He tried to buy Cuba, but Spain wouldn't sell the island, and then he thought about invading it to take the island, but decided against it. I guess that's a C. Franklin strongly enforced the Fugitive Slave Act, even though he didn't have to. He'll land another F. Overall, Franklin gets an F. The grief and the alcoholism that came with the loss of his kids made Pierce unable to tackle the incredibly hard problems he was faced with. Today, we're rating Alec Baldwin's presidency. That's Millard Fillmore. No way. Yeah. That is remarkably strange. Did you know that 8% of Americans can name Millard Fillmore as a president? Here's a criteria. Let's see why no one knows who Millard is. Millard's domestic legacy is the Compromise of 1850. The Compromise of 1850 makes California a state, allows the newly captured territories from the Mexican-American War to determine if they have slaves or not, and of course, a new and improved version of the Fugitive Slave Act. People hear the word compromise and they think everyone is happy, but that wasn't the case here. The compromise angered everyone. I'm not going to condescend to the past about why the compromise would become pointless 10 years later. I am going to give Millard an F for approving the Fugitive Slave Act, domestically and in racial equality. Abroad, he sent Commodore Perry on a trade mission to Japan to open it up to outside trade. He also prevented France and England from annexing Hawaii. The South kept trying to overthrow and annex Cuba on their own. Fillmore was obviously against this. He'll get an A. Overall, Fillmore gets a D. Zachary Taylor, the man who died a year into his presidency after eating a lot of cherries and milk. Here's the criteria, let's see how he did. When Taylor comes in the office to debate over what to do with the newly gained land for the Mexican-American War is in full swing. Taylor owned slaves, but he saw the writing on the wall about slavery. He saw that it was economically unfeasible to continue the practice, so he opposed expanding slavery to the newly acquired territories. He urged Congress to admit California and New Mexico as states as both opposed slavery. He opposed the Compromise of 1850. Upon finding this out, Southerners started to threaten to secede. Taylor told a group of Southern leaders that he would hang anyone who tried to disrupt the Union, and that he would do it quicker than he had killed deserters and spies in the army. He also added that he would personally lead the army to Texas if it meant putting down a rebellion. Taylor gets a B domestically. Abroad, most of Taylor's one year was spent trying to stop private American citizens from overthrowing various countries' governments. He also got a treaty that would lay the groundwork for an eventual canal in Central America. That's a B. Taylor was devoted to telling the South to go fly a kite and preventing slavery from pushing westward. So that's an A. Overall, Taylor gets a B. James K. Polk, he ran on a one-term promise, and when his four years are up, he left. Here's a criteria, let's see how he did. Domestically, Polk vetoed every single internal improvements bill that came to his desk, and he reduced tariffs. He also founded the Department of the Interior. Polk's abroad policies only made the situation at home much, much worse. That'll land him a C. Polk oversaw the second largest land expansion in American history. He approved the annexation of Texas. He also ended the British occupation of Oregon by agreeing to split the territory on the 49th parallel. The Mexican-American War might be one of the most unjust wars in American history. At least Abraham Lincoln 
continue Ulysses S. Grant thought so. The victory in this war gave the United States what is now the entire Southwest. Polk's expansion essentially caused the Civil War. Grant said that the Civil War was God's punishment for the Mexican-American War. Polk kicked over a 20-mile long line of dominoes, and the grade you give him, especially abroad, is determined by how many miles of dominoes you're willing to say he's responsible for knocking over. I'm unsure, so he'll land a C. Polk owned slaves personally, and he also started a war that caused slavery to expand. That'll get him an F. Overall, Polk gets a D. They were talking about the only American president to have committed treason, John Tyler. Seriously, f this guy. Here's a criteria, let's see why he sucks. Tyler vetoed the creation of a national bank, and this made people across the country pretty upset. Congress was like, hmm, that's odd, that must have been a mistake, so they tried again. Tyler vetoed it again, and somehow people got even angrier. So Tyler was like, okay, let's compromise, and Congress agrees. Tyler then vetoed the compromise bill. At this point, Congress had enough, and so did his own cabinet. His entire cabinet resigned. Congress called on him to resign. He refused. So Congress started impeachment proceedings, and they expelled him from his own party. He irritated Congress so much that they refused to allocate money to repair the White House, which was in pretty rough shape. That'll land him an F. Abroad, he signed a treaty of Great Britain to end the dispute over the territory in North America. That's why Maine is shaped the way it is. On his last day in office, he annexed Texas, which basically tied Polk hands on the issue. That'll land him a D. Tyler was one of our most pro-slavery presidents. He'll land an F. After being president, he joined the Confederacy, so he'll land an F overall. Not for that, but he should get an F for that. William Henry Harrison. Here's our criteria. Let's see how he did. You know, uh, he, well, he was definitely a president. He'll get a C. Martin Van Buren. No one cares about this guy. My evidence for this is that a good portion of you didn't realize that this isn't actually Martin Van Buren. This is actually Martin Van Buren. Here's a criteria. Let's see how he did. Van Buren failing to discontinue Jackson's monetary policies made the panic of 1837 much worse than it needed to be. Van Buren continued Jackson's Indian removal policies. Jackson was responsible for the policies, but Van Buren is the one who actually executed the Trail of Tears. That'll land him an F. Van Buren opposed the annexation of Texas as he felt that annexing Texas would disturb the domestic peace. Van Buren oversaw what was kind of a proxy war in Canada between American citizens, Canadian rebels, and Great Britain. However, he was able to peacefully solve the conflict to prevent an all-out war. He'll actually score a B here. Van Buren believed that abolitionists were the greatest threat to the nation's unity and not, you know, slave owners. However, Van Buren was very aware of the powder keg that was slavery. It's why he opposed the annexation of Texas. He knew that if the United States kept expanding, the question of slavery would only grow hotter and would create sectional violence inside the country. He'll get a D. Oh, by the way, that second guy I showed you isn't Martin Van Buren. This is actually Martin Van Buren. Overall, he gets a D. Andrew Jack. Jackson. Thomas Jefferson hated him and Donald Trump loved him. It seems as though 50% of people love him, the other 50% hate him. Let's find out which half is going to be mad at me. Jackson dismantled the National Bank and paid off the entire national debt. This ended up causing the greatest economic crisis in American history until the Great Depression. Jackson created the spoil system. Under the spoil system, people were hired based on their loyalty to the president rather than merit. In 1832, South Carolina tried to nullify a tariff inside the state. Jackson declared that states did not have the right of nullification. That'll be a D. Jackson is chiefly responsible for the Indian Removal Act and the events that followed. It. The act passed the House by only four votes. It was controversial even then. The Supreme Court ruled that states didn't have the rights to remove tribes from the state, but Jackson refused to enforce the ruling. The United States forced these tribes to accept treaties that were violating past treaties, and then used military force to remove the tribes. This is truly one of the lowest moments in this country's history. That'll be an F. Jackson allowed his postmaster general to censor the mail and to prevent abolitionist pamphlets from being delivered to the South. He even suggested suppressing abolitionist free speech as a whole. That's an F. Overall, Jackson gets an F. John Quincy Adams, he is one of the greatest Americans in history. He was a massive abolitionist, and he actually died on the floor of the United States House. Here's a criteria, let's see how he did. Adams had big goals, but due to the nature of his victory and Congress blocking nearly everything, he was able to accomplish less than he desired. Adams did manage to get several infrastructure projects done. This included creating the first passenger train, expanding roads, and creating canals. These internal improvements sped up America's development rapidly. This will land him a B. Adams expanded U.S. trade across the globe and expanded the U.S. relationships around the globe with diplomacy. Adams sought to create a canal in Panama. A lot of things that Adams could have handled as president, he solved as Monroe's Secretary of State. He'll land an A. Adams, like his father, didn't own slaves. He's in this weird spot because he is a president before and after two abolitionist movements. He'll get a seat. But let me tell you about what he did as a congressman after he was president. There was a gag rule preventing slavery from being discussed on the House floor. Every day, Adams submitted a petition on slavery, breaking the gag rule. Overall, Adams gets a B. James Monroe. He was the end of an era, the last of the founding fathers and the last of the Virginia dynasty. He's also the only president since Washington to run unopposed. Here's our criteria. Let's see how he did. Monroe faced the first major economic crisis in America's history. He kind of just didn't respond to it. He signs the original Missouri Compromise, and you could argue that this made the Civil War inevitable. Monroe was also Mr. Infrastructure. He wanted canals and roads to help further develop the United States. He'll get a B domestically. Monroe is most known for the Monroe Doctrine. The Monroe Doctrine essentially said that the U.S. was in charge of the Western Hemisphere and Europe was to stay out of it. While other presidents used the doctrine to justify using force, Monroe primarily chose 
chose diplomacy everywhere but Florida. A lot of Monroe's foreign policy was done by John Quincy Adams. He'll get a B. Unlike Adams, Monroe wasn't an abolitionist. Monroe seized land in West Africa to form a colony to send freed slaves. This place is now known as Liberia. I think we all understand how this is ridiculous and wrong. That's an F. Overall, the last founding father gets a C. James Madison, he's the president who wraps up the story of the founders. Here's the criteria, let's see how he did. Madison planned to continue Jefferson's financial policies. After the War of 1812, Madison leaned in the Hamilton's economic system for the United States. It's that move by Madison that really saves the country and allows it to prosper. He also admitted Indiana as a state. Ever been to Indiana? Big mistake. However, it won't affect his grade, he'll get an A. James Madison was a wartime president. The War of 1812 started because those damn redcoats are taking over American vessels. America responded by invading Canada, as one does. The United States most certainly did not win the War of 1812, as exhibited by the fact that Canada is a country that exists. However, the U.S. did gain a sense of confidence, purpose, and established itself as a real country. The United States also fought a second war against pirates. It won the war in two days compared to the four years it took the first time. That'll give him a B. Madison favored the idea of a gradual abolition of slavery, but he was also a walking contradiction because he never made any moves to end slavery and own slaves himself. He was self-aware that he was a hypocrite. He didn't do anything to further slavery, but he also didn't restrict it. So he defaults to a C. Overall, Madison gets a B. Thomas Jefferson is America. He certainly represents the paradox that is America. A land proclaiming liberty, but it's a land built on slave labor. A starry-eyed people that recoiled when it actually came to making their words into actions. Here's the criteria, let's see how he did. Jefferson tried to undo key parts of Hamilton's financial system. He didn't really succeed at it. He is also responsible for the Louisiana Purchase. This doubled the size of the United States. This will get him a B. Jefferson didn't want a standing military. These plans were halted when the United States had to go to war against pirates, and ultimately made Jefferson reverse his stance on not wanting a navy. He also banned trade of Europe and this plummeted the US economy and he had to lift the ban. This will get him a C. Jefferson genuinely believed slavery was wrong. He had advocated for the abolition of slavery nationwide, in the Northwest Territories, and in Virginia. As we know though, he still owned slaves and did some heinous things. The answer as to why is quite simple. Money. It doesn't absolve him of his crimes though. We only grade presidents based on what they did as president. Jefferson made the international slave trade illegal as soon as he was constitutionally able to. He'll get a B. Overall, Jefferson gets a C. John Adams, the second president of the United States, he's not on money, but Paul Giamatti played him in a TV show, so that's a fair trade-off. Here's the criteria, let's see how he did. John Adams signed the Alien and Sedition Acts. These acts ran pretty counter to the Bill of Rights. The acts are looked at as a disgrace today, however, looking back, I think it's pretty easy to see why Adams signed the bills. He also levied a direct tax to help pay for the war. He'll get a C. Adams was a wartime president. France and Britain were at war, and France viewed the U.S. trading with Britain as a violation of neutrality. Adams sent a delegation to negotiate peace with France. France's minister wanted to bribe before negotiations could begin. When Adams told Congress, Congress didn't believe him, so Adams released the letters from the diplomats in France in an event that is known as the XYC Affair. This led to the only war between France and the US called the Quasi War. The war ended once Napoleon decided the war was over. This would get him an A. Adams didn't do anything to further racial equity, however, he was seriously opposed to slavery throughout his entire life. That's a C. Overall, Adams scores a C. Make sure to give this a like if you liked it, because I'm not sure if anyone wants to still see Washington's grade. For 44 videos now, I've graded every US president on this criteria. Every president has had precedents, standards, and traditions to follow or to break, all except one, George Washington. We often look at our history and assume that everything that happened was bound to happen, and there was no alternative, but that's often not the case. There was no guarantee that the United States would last. Runaway revolutions and revolutions becoming what they hated are perhaps more common than revolutions succeeding and living up to its founding values. Washington took control of a new country that was barely a country. It's hard to explain in 60 seconds just how at odds the North and the South were even before 1789. For Washington to be able to hold the two together and give legitimacy to the federal government in spite of that is an immaculate accomplishment. He was very aware that every single thing he did set a precedent. If Jefferson, Hamilton, or Madison had been made the first president, there's not a chance that we would have made it more than 100 years before our first civil war. Lincoln saved it, FDR made it a superpower, and LBJ made it live up to its founding values. Washington's list of accomplishments looks small compared to theirs, but his steadiness is why they even mattered in the first place. For that reason, Washington bypasses the criteria for an A. Tune in for a review on Biden's first 100 days.